25th morning session of the Portland City Council. Keelan, good morning. Please call the roll. Good morning. Maps. Here. Rubio. Here. Ryan. Here. Gonzalez. Here. Wheeler. Here. The rules. Good morning. Welcome to Portland City Council. To testify before council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging with city council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. 
disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered. When testifying, state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Disclose if you're a lobbyist. If you're representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. Thank you. All right, first up is communications 889. First individual, please. Request of Tim Hanks McGair to address council regarding Grant Bull. They canceled their request. 890, please. Request of Patrick Cashman to address council regarding City Hall concerns. Uh, Morning. Patrick was going to join online. I don't see them yet. 891. Request of Amayir Bashir to address council regarding Division Street medians. They were going to join virtually as well. They haven't joined yet. 892. Request of Jean Hendren to address council regarding communication with unsheltered neighbors. Good morning. We didn't expect you to be up so soon. We thought there'd be oh. several other people. So welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. My name is Jean Hendren, for the record. Welcome, Jean. And uh, for the last almost four years now, I have been trying to keep our unsheltered neighbors on the streets of Salem alive. Sorry, I'm going to get tearful. Yeah. And um, so I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot. I obviously couldn't change the minds of City Hall and how they go about um, assisting or getting rid of mainly is what they try to do, our unsheltered neighbors. So I went to trying to save their lives. In communicating with them, I discovered that gaining trust is the most effective thing that you can do. You can't do this in a society where social service providers do not answer their phones. You can simply use a portable phone in the office. It's easy to pass off to somebody else if you get another call while you're on that one. Um, I did it for many, many years in the state of Washington working for that state. We were mandated to answer our phones. It's a complete world of difference and it's easy to do. It's a policy change. It's absolutely free except for the portable phone. Um, if you're yelling or denigrating somebody, it's much easier to solve a problem by listening. And they're not going to hear you if you're yelling or denigrating. Um, they're just going to turn a, a blind ear to you. So um, by listening to the people you're providing services for, um, you begin to understand what actually is going to help them get to the point where not only we want them to be, where they want to be. Um, if we can't include our unsheltered neighbors in our policy decisions, we'll never overcome the problem of having the poor and the unconventional dropping out of society. Using methods of communication that your listeners will understand. I walk around the trails of Wallace Marine Park whenever we have a free pet clinic handing out flyers. I tape one to the porta potty down there and um, they get the message and they come out and get all of their pets vaccinated for rabies. It's a great system, particularly if you need the exercise. Phones don't work often because most of the people living on the streets have had their phones stolen, they're lost or they're broken, or they can't charge them. Um, I am running out of time. I just want to say, Right side up. I know what it's like to lose everything. I was in that car. That semi crossed over into my lane of travel and nearly killed me. So I suppose I have a easier time empathizing. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. And, and I want to underscore something you said that yes. rings really true with me. Um, we have found that you have to have 
interventions that are done by credible individuals to those who are needing the assistance. And so one thing that this council has done is we've hired an organization called Urban Alchemy. Urban Alchemy has people who are largely former offenders. Almost all of them are previously homeless. They do the outreach and connection and build that trust with people on the streets and encourage them to seek services that we provide through other venues. And their success rate, from my perspective, completely validates what you're saying about having people awesome. who really understand how to work with a population that, uh, that has its own unique challenges. And so I, I just want to say that really resonates with me, what Certainly you said. Certainly not something that anybody can't do. It just takes knowledge. But Absolutely. I don't think too many people have four years to spend on the street seven days a week. So. Yeah, you're right. Thank you for being Thank here. You. Appreciate you. Uh, next individual, please, 893. Request of Emily Kerrigan to address council regarding liquid mercury attack. Good morning. I'm deaf in my right ear, so just a heads up if I don't hear something you might say. Um, my name is Emily Kerrigan. I am speaking on behalf of myself. Um, Sorry, just hearing it made me a little emotional. <sighs> I've been barricading my front door for two months now with my kitchen chairs. And I will be outlining why this is happening to me. Um, as I believe, I, what happened to me is either attempted murder or domestic terrorism or both, and currently being deemed by the Portland Police Department as criminal mischief at best. On July 15th, I approached a man walking out of a neighbor's vacant home who had been running a trap house and um, asked him to get off the property. And um, after that confrontation between July 15th and August 24th, he and his crew slashed my tire once, hit and rode it twice, and then keyed it drastically three times, and the fourth was pouring liquid mercury on my car. On 824, I noticed the latest car keying, um, so I called the business I live above, Monticello's, and asked them to pull the video surveillance, because that's where I park now, so that I can have it on record, and they confirmed that it was recorded. They came out to see the king as they were concerned and discovered liquid mercury balls on the top of my car. I immediately then called poison control and just discussed with them what I should be concerned with for myself, for my health, and what I should do. And they said to call the non-emergency line, so I called non-emergency. I waited on hold for over two hours. Um, was interviewed by the operator. An officer called me back within an hour or so and um, told me it was not 911 worthy and that um, there was not much that he could do. Um, and so I asked him, shouldn't hazmat be there? That's what poison control said it should be there. And he said, sure, maybe it's not my expertise. Why don't you Google it? And I said, well, how do I contact hazmat? He said, Google it. I don't know. And so I called back poison control and uh, game planned with them that the next morning I would call the fire department directly at 8 a.m. when they opened in hopes to leave them a voicemail, which I did. They then called me back within the hour and said, absolutely not, you should have called 911 last night. <laughs> Get off the phone with us right now. I called 911, Hazmat was there within five minutes. They had a great response time. Um, they contained what they could and within that time frame, um, the next day EPA and DEQ arrived to decontaminate the scene. They were there for four days full, um, decontaminating the block and the street side where liquid mercury was found. My car was deemed totaled. My house and, or my apartment and Monticello's both had to be tested by the EPA. I have heard from the police department once in the two months since this event. There has been no help. The suspect has been on arrest. I'm gonna keep going. The suspect has been on arrest uh, October 7th. He was in custody from the 7th to the 10th with five 
felonies and three misdemeanors, and he was not questioned during that time about my case. And the officer that I spoke to the one time on my birthday on September 26th told me the reason they hadn't done anything with my case is because they couldn't co locate him. So they've had him in possession and they've done nothing, and they let him go again. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here, and I'm sorry this happened to you. And it sounds like the police response was less than adequate. Yes. And I obviously don't have the details, uh, but I will have somebody from the police bureau reach out to you because it, it sounds like you should have at least had more of a follow-up. And so I'm, I'm not sure what happened. I can't speak for the police bureau in this case, but I will make sure that somebody follows up with you. Thank you. And I'm sorry that happened. Commissioner Gonzalez. Um, thanks so much for your testimony. I want to speak to the pieces that I'm aware of with respect to your case. I am uh, the Commissioner of Public Safety. I am responsible for BOAC. Um, there were mistakes made in the dispatch of your matter. And on behalf of the city of Portland, I apologize for that. We have a strict quality assurance program that reassesses the performance of all of our dispatchers. This was flagged as a mistake. Um, hazmat attacks are rare. Uh, that's part of the reason that uh, we have diagnosed that it was mishandled on the initial intake. Uh, it's just they don't see it very much. Uh, that's not an excuse. It's just giving you context. Uh, the dispatcher has subsequently been coached on how to better assess these on when they come in initially. Uh, we're evaluating whether there'll be some shifts in protocol. We'll work with BOAC on that. Again, it's, it's incredibly rare, fortunately. It's not good for you in this situation. I just wanted you to have that context. Um, there are uh, other pieces that you're speaking to more broadly in the criminal justice system. How do we deal with these habitual criminals Correct. that are engaging in these behaviors? That is a systemic solution that we need to tackle. Uh, I don't know if there's a simple switch there that's working as a city as a unified voice on the importance of going after these these perpetuators of this type of uh, intimidation and crime. We have to work with the county. We have to work with the DA on that. So I just, again, I want to apologize on the city's portion of this, specifically um, uh, the mishandling of the initial call. It sounds like fire responded effectively once they were properly uh, notified. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, and Nick Coffey is in the, in the building, uh, raising his hand right behind me. Um, feel free to touch base with him just if you'd like to have a follow-up on uh, what else BOAC is doing to address at least their portion of it. And again, thank you for testifying. Yes, could I speak one more time sure. really quickly? Um, the officer that did call me on 926 told me another um, thing was that they couldn't consider it attempted murder unless there were, they knew that he was smart enough that liquid mercury would kill me, even though it's one of the top five most, least, most, most lethal chemicals on the planet. Um, I still have not gone to the doctor to have my blood work done because I'm nervous. So do I need to have that proof for them to do something more? Yeah, I, I, I can't necessarily speak to the police component of it. Uh, well, I, that, that's a public health question. I mean, the, there, we're way out of our league here. Uh, you do not want to take medical advice from any of us. Oh, out no, here. I'm not asking so for medical let, advice. I'm let, asking what does what need what extremes need to happen for you to action? Yeah. So here's here's what I'm going to do. Um, Megan, who's sitting there, has already tipped off my senior policy director on public safety, Stephanie. She will be reaching out to you personally. And we'll take it from there. Thank you. Great. Thank you for being here. And I'm sorry this happened to you. Did any of the other communications show up? No. Very good. Uh, we'll move on, please, to the consent agendas. Have any items been pulled off the consent agenda? Uh, one item has been pulled. I'm 901. sorry, which one? 901. And uh, is that all that's been pulled? Yes. Please call the roll on the Matt. remainder of the consent agenda. Thank you. Max. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. No, aye. Wheeler. Aye. The consent agenda is approved. First time certain item, please, 894. Proclaim October 2023 to be National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Colleagues, our next item is a proclamation naming October of 2023 to be National Disability Employment Awareness Month. For the presentation on this proclamation, I'd like to welcome 
Leah Espinoza, who is an analyst in PPR. Welcome. Uh, Tom Haig, who's the former PBOT employee, a former PBOT employee and a published author. And Christina Wienholtz, a 311 customer service rep. Thanks for being here this morning. And you can all just begin whenever you're ready. It's good to see you all here. Thank you for being here. Can the rest of our leadership team sit back with us? Like, However you'd like, yeah, okay. whatever, whatever is most comfortable. Go ahead and start whenever you're good to go. Does the proclamation get read? Um, I, I can. I usually do it at the end. Oh, okay. uh, typically, we'll let you guys have your say. Um, then my colleagues might have something they'd like to say, and then I'll read the proclamation okay. at the end, if, if that's okay, if that works for you. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. Let me just get my... Good morning, my name is Leah Espinosa. I am on the leadership team of City Disability Network and the rest of my team who can be here is with me today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today and share a statement on behalf of my fellow members of our employee resource group, City Disability Network. We are appreciative of the reading of the proclamation today in recognition of Disability Employment Awareness Month we aim to grow awareness, understanding, and supportive action based on our experiences as city employees with, who live with disabilities. We represent a community of people who understand intersectionality more than any other demographic because disability can affect any body at any time and in any circumstance. Disability can be short-term or long-term, minimally impacting life or severely impacting function. It can affect any of our bodily functions, brains and minds, mobility, senses, appearance, relationships, our roles in community and our interactions with society. I'd like to ask all of you who are here in the, in the chamber today, if you have the ability to stand or raise your hand or if you wanna just nod in agreement, if you have ever experienced a disabling condition in your lifetime. Thank you. It is important for us to know that disability is on a spectrum of visibility, diagnosability, and support ability. Not everyone has the privilege of health care or is fortunate enough to obtain a diagnosis and effective treatment. Care and treatment can be traumatizing. Conditions can be invisible or neglected and are often stigmatized. And medical bias often prevents and blocks care to those most marginalized and vulnerable in our society. Society was built around a limited definition of normal and able. And not only do we not fit into those ablest views, there are some who believe people with disabilities can't be successful at work or contribute as members of society. And despite these challenges, we are here. We are City of Portland employees, and we reach beyond the boundaries of our abilities to fight for our right to be here. We exist, we're engaged, we're talented, smart, and wise, we're advocates, we bring new perspectives and approaches to accomplishing the work of the city. Some of us still live with our disabilities hidden for fear of stigma and judgment, but we're proud public servants and we are representative of the disability community in Portland. We recognize that change happens, budget cuts exist, and program priorities shift, 
but we ask you to consider what it would look like to evolve into a city of Portland that truly values disability equity and disability justice. What would that look like? We hope it wouldn't look like cutting jobs. Like the loss of one of our city disability network leadership team members, Tom Haig, two weeks ago to PWOP budget cuts. We hope it wouldn't look like discontinuing ADA positions embedded as coordinators and analysts throughout the city offices and bureaus. Instead, we implore you to recruit and hire us, accommodate and support us, promote us, and listen to us. Do more than the bare minimum for ADA legal compliance. Do more than read a proclamation. Go beyond by finding ways to translate those words into action. Consider new ways of valuing and validating us. Encourage BHR to improve responsiveness and effectiveness of the ADA accommodations process. We have been having several members monthly come to us as a leadership team saying that the process is not working for them and this is devastating news. Move away from the disparity-ridden medical model of disability and to the more inclusive social model of disability like PSU recently did. Provide more resources to BHR's model employer strategic plan, which the City Disability Network helped them to develop. Expand opportunities to telework when possible. Educate supervisors and managers on how to support and effectively manage staff with differences in physical and mental life circumstances. Find ways to include us at the table in programmatic and operational decision making across the city. Because what we offer is more than ability, it is capability. Capable of compassion, seeing, hearing, and speaking in different ways, finding creative workarounds, fighting mental illness and inner demons, overcoming devastating sickness and injury, and most important, capable of a successful and powerful work when we have the resources and conditions needed to thrive. Will the city of Portland commit to the resources and conditions needed for us to thrive by becoming an employer of choice for people with disabilities? We believe the city has the ability and capability to move forward with us in partnership on a path that is transformative, inclusive, and accessible. I'm going to give a moment for my colleague Tom to have some commentary. Morning, everybody. I am uh, Tom Haig. I'm the co-founder of the International Rehabilitation Forum, a nonprofit that focus, uh, focuses on maximizing the independence and leadership of all persons with physical limitations. In addition, I've worked with the Portland Bureau of Transportation on accessibility issues for the last two and a half years. Before my time with PBOT, I spent a decade traveling the world, filming documentary and training films on accessibility topics. I embedded myself in disability communities in Albania, Bangladesh, France, Ghana, India, Nepal, and Senegal. And since my accident here in 1996, I visited most of the major US cities from the seat of my wheelchair. I can report with a great deal of certainty that as far as disability awareness and accommodation, Portland, Oregon is the best disability city in the world. Our transportation system is second to none. The work of Harper's Playground and Portland Parks is revolutionary. Even more important, our businesses embrace inclusion. Instead of trying to escape ADA regulations on non-existent grandfather clauses, they have made tremendous adaptations to accommodate us. We are a global model of excellence that should be copied all around the world. But being a global leader has its responsibilities. Portland needs to stay on the cutting edge of disability awareness. That means increased awareness and accommodations of invisible, temporary, and neurodivergent disabilities. It's easy to look at me and see the obstacles. I'm the guy in the wheelchair. I'm the symbol on the parking spots. And people are overwhelmingly helpful. But when your disability is not visible, the discrimination is much more prevalent. How many incredible talents are we missing because we don't invite differences? We don't know how to interview someone on the, spe on the aut autism spectrum, someone with social anxiety, a dyslexic who makes a mistake on their resume. It's the new frontier. 
But knowing the character of this city, I am confident we will attack these issues with the same foresight and enthusiasm we have towards physical disabilities. This proclamation and the model employer strategic plan it mentions are critical factors in the city's continuing leadership. We're rolling in the right direction. Thank you, Tom. And I'm also going to give a few moments to my friend Christina. I'm nervous. <laughs> Glad to have you here, Christina. Thank you. I believe the more that people with disabilities see themselves in government offices and see their interests supported and elevated in the programs we fund, the more people will become engaged and the more inclusive, inclusive the city of Portland will become. I can speak from personal experience that I came to work from this, for the city through the, my engagement with the Office of Community and Civic Life Disability Leadership Development Program and would love to see the city re-implement these types of programs. At the start of the pandemic, the city received federal funds to help support the needs of those most affected by the pandemic. One of those groups were people with disabilities. As a staff member, I was able to work with several other city employees to start some very good and important supportive work of the very vulnerable community members. And I believe the city needs to continue to show their commitment to this type of work by dedicating more of their time and resources to continue the, to advance the work of disability equity, both for city employees and community members with disabilities across Portland. I know budgets are tight and that we are also at a historical moment for our city as we work to implement a new form of government. During the transition, we need to be smart about how we structure our government and the work that we are doing to ensure that people dis with disabilities are being supported and encouraged to participate as equal members in the community. Currently, many of our efforts to support the disability community are spread across the city and are not as coordinated as they could be. We currently lack a centralized disability program at the city, so I am hopeful that during this transition, we at the City of Portland government can strengthen our efforts to elevate the needs of this an important and growing part of our community. One of the city's core values is equity, and representation is a very important demonstration of this value. The city has racial equity and disability equity goals. Both of these goals need to be embraced to have true equity at the city. Equity must include people with disabilities, and it is important that we also apply an intersectional lens to equity because we know that people of color with disabilities are more impacted than those of us in white bodies. As a person with a disability, a Portlander, and a city employee, I humbly request the full funding of current existing positions that serve people with disabilities, including those currently classified as limited term, temporary, or those facing elimination or reduction due to budget cuts. The city of Portland needs more additional reliable, consistent rep representation for people with disabilities and not less. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes our presentation, and um, at the end of the, any commentary, we'd also like to request a photo, and if any City Disability Network members are in the chamber, they can join us for that. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Um, so at this point, thank you for your presentation. I know some of my colleagues would, would like to say something as well. We'll start with Commissioner Maps. So uh, hand is raised. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to start out by thanking uh, Leah, Tom, and Christina for joining us today and sharing that um, uh, powerful and uh, well thought out testimony. And colleagues, I also want to say this. 
I'm delighted to join you in proclaiming October 2023 to be National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Now, the roots of National Disability Employment Awareness Month go all the way back to 1945, when Congress passed Public Law 176, which designated the first week of October to be National Employee the Physically Handicapped Week. The purpose of that annual declaration was to educate the public about the issues relating to disability and employment. In 1962, this week was rebranded as National Employ the Handicapped Week. The point of that name change was to acknowledge the employment challenges faced by people with all types of disabilities. And in 1988, Congress expanded this event to encompass all of October and changed the name to National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Which brings us to our current moment. During National Disability Employment Awareness Month, we recognize the contributions that disabled Americans have made to our workforce, and we reaffirm our commitment to ensure equal opportunity for all people. Now, this month is important because too often, people with disabilities want to work but cannot find jobs. In fact, today, uh, unemployment rates amongst the disabled are three times higher than unemployment rates for the population at large. And with folks with disabilities do find work, often they are paid less than their counterparts. And as we have learned today, that is true even here in Portland, where 22 percent of our residents live with disabilities, and about one-third of disabled Portlanders live below the poverty line. Now, colleagues, those difficult facts are why it is important that we reinvigorate our efforts to eliminate the barriers that block disabled Portlanders from fully participating in the labor market. I want to thank our panel for the ideas that they presented to us uh, today around how we can do that. I um, am deeply committed to following up on those and trying to implement those um, in the 13 months that we have left in this building. And that is also why I'm proud to join you in declaring October 2023 to be National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Thank you very much, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you. Um, so thank you all for being here today and, and for your, your powerful words and testimony. Um, during the National Disability Employment Month um, event this year um, at the White House, uh, President Biden reminded everybody that this, this country was founded on the idea of equality and that we deserve to be treated equally throughout our whole lives. And that means everyone. So it's important that we take the time to acknowledge that people with disabilities have long strengthened and contributed to our economy, contributed to our culture and our world and our workplaces. And now more than ever, it's critical that employers in both public and private sectors not only commit to, but double down on effective disability inclusion. And when I, I say effective, I mean authentically doing, it, doing so. Um, and also consistent reinforcement of that commitment um, to employees. So for employers, disability justice means creating the conditions and environment where employees with disabilities are able to bring their full selves to work and also have the environment to contribute equally and effectively. And establishing credibility as a disability inclusive employer to the surrounding community is a critical step towards getting individuals with disabilities to, to act, know that they will be respected and included in that workplace. So we have to be walking the talk. 
So I just want to thank uh, you, Leah, and Tom, and Christina, and everybody who's here today for reminding us of our collective responsibility to, the, to those things. And it's heartening to hear from you, Tom, about how our city is leading the way in disability awareness. And like you also said, this brings a deeper responsibility to continue that work, to continue to learn and become better uh, and not complacent. So um, I think we can get there um, because when we demonstrate this and do our part, we're building that more inclusive and representative world that we want. So thank you again for all your advocacy. <clears throat> thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Commissioner Ryan. Yes, thanks. Um, good morning and thank you, Leah. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Christina. Good to see you. And all of your colleagues who are here today. It says a lot when you're all visibly in front of us. And I just wanna, um, before I go into my prepared remarks, I wanted to acknowledge your testimony will stay with me. Um, I liked hearing about going beyond medical to include social, and also a centralized disability system. We have a lot of that at the city where we have little silos and you're wondering how the dots connect to actually have impact, and so you're reminding us we have this here as well, so I appreciate that. Um, I also wanna make some special acknowledgement of one of the Parks and Rec employees, um, Ann Cuomo. Um, Ann has been part of the City of Portland team since December 9th, 1999. And over the past 24 years, she's worked in various capacities from supporting Urban Forestry Commission. There you are. Hi, Anne. I thought that was your <laughs> but I wasn't 100% sure. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to talk about you a little bit more. Okay, great. How comfortable is this? Um, from supporting the Urban Forestry Commission to her current role as an office support specialist for the Land Stewardship Program. Anne is knowledgeable about all things Portland, and she is proud to be an involved Portlander. And I want to personally thank you for your service to our city and for your commitment to accessibility within our parks and open spaces. I'd also like to thank Parks and Rec and our community members who had a vision and made it a reality and really put us on the map with Harper's Playground. And we have more to come. That Arbor Lodge Park is a flagship location of a new network of inclusive nature-infused playgrounds. And it's also in my neighborhood, so it's been wonderful to, mm -hmm. to partake in, to observe. And to our disabled and differently abled citizens, I see you, I appreciate you. And in fact, we all know that we are, we all should remember, we're just one instant away from being disabled ourselves. I thought it was really um, smart that you had us stand or raise our hand. I, didn't, I don't think about it a lot, but when I moved back home in 1995, I was officially disabled by Social Security. It was before the new medicines with HIV and I was told that I couldn't work any longer. So um, I really um, went through a lot just to fill out that paperwork and to get that designation. It's a longer conversation about how odd it was to be told that you're, you, you have to go back to work and it's no longer true and undo that paperwork, if you will. So I also um, have empathy for all the extra steps you have to take to do life that go beyond what we can see. So um, we will continue to work together and create more inclusive, accessible, and equitable spaces for all Portlanders. Let's keep leading the way. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Gonzalez. I just want to echo the eloquent words of my colleagues today, uh, and I just want to uh, thank Portland employees uh, for shedding life, uh, light on both our successes in the city of Portland and our opportunities for growth in this area, because we really heard both. Uh, we do some things well. We've got a lot of work to do uh, going forward. Uh, celebrated National uh, Disability Employment Awareness Month this morning with One Community 2023 uh, by the Relay Resources. So uh, very much engaged in the dialogue in our community about this, uh, both for employees as well as for our children uh, and making sure we are an accessible city for um, yeah, children regardless of their particular circumstances. So again, thank you so much for uh, being with us today and calling attention to this important work. Thank you. Uh, and I'll just join my colleagues in thanking you for being here. Thanks for your testimony. Thanks for highlighting the successes. And I actually very much appreciate the, the thoughtful list of areas where we need to improve. And I was listening intently and taking notes that uh, no doubt I will not be able to read later. So I'll just come back and look at the testimony. But you made some very concrete, very specific asks. And I thought they made a tremendous amount of sense. So thank you for that. I also just want to say that it's important that the city of Portland continue to engage people with all types of different backgrounds, including our disability community, uh, because the public we serve is as multifaceted, and it's important that we have those different perspectives. 
and I'm proud of the fact that we have a workforce that continues to benefit from all of you and your presence and your strong leadership. You bring different talents, different perspectives, different ideas, uh, but at the end of the day, you're all part of the city team working hard to do well on behalf of our public, and I appreciate the fact that you represent an important part of our public. Uh, there's been a lot of good recent events, the formation of the City Disability Network, that's the City of Portland Affinity Group. Um, obviously, there are, are many steps that we can take to move forward to improve, and uh, that's why we're all here together, to celebrate what we've done, but also to be frank and acknowledge where we have to go. So I want to thank all of you for helping to draft this proclamation, which I will read on behalf of all of us. So thank you for, for drafting it. Whereas the United States Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy designates each October as National Disability Employment Awareness Month, and the theme chosen for 2023 is Advancing Access and Equity. In 1945, an effort to educate the public about the issues related to disability and employment started when the United States Congress enacted Public Law 176 and recognized the first week of October to be designated as National Employee of Physically Handicapped Week. In 1962, revisions to the law acknowledged all kinds of disabilities and eventually the celebration became the entire month. And whereas Alexander and Albertina Kerr lived and were married in Portland in 1910, but Albertina died from typhus the next year. To honor her advocacy for homeless children, Alexander donated the family home to the organization that eventually became the Albertina Kerr Center. The Kerr organization has protected and cared for those most in need in Portland ever since, and today empowering people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, IDD, and mental health challenges to lead self-determined lives in their communities through career and life support. The Kerr organization has partnered with several Portland agencies, including launching Adoptive Bike Town with partners including the Portland Bureau of Transportation, and whereas American and regional progress in the public's attitude and perception of the abilities of the disabled worker has changed markedly over time. And the city of Portland is currently home to approximately 21.8% or 140,000 people living with disabilities. 35.4% of Portland community members living with disabilities aged 18 to 64 live, before, live below the poverty level. That's 35.4% below the poverty level. For Portland disabled workers over the age of 16, the percentage working from home is 7.8% insight into the lived experiences of Portlanders living with disabilities can be learned from the 2021 Disability Equity Engagement Survey Report from the Office of Equity and Human Rights. Furthermore, as of January 2022, there were 389, 5.6% of employees at the City of Portland who self-identify as having a disability. And whereas the City Disability Network, CDN, was officially recognized as a City of Portland Affinity Group in February of 2022 and currently has more than 100 members. Affinity groups at the City of Portland are made possible through the City's volunteer-run Diverse and Empowered Employees of Portland organization, otherwise known as DEEP. CDN seeks to facilitate community connections and professional support for City of Portland employees who self-identify as a person living with physical, mental, or other neurotype health disabilities. And whereas, the City Disability Network encourages Portlanders to support local businesses and nonprofit organizations which support workers living with disabilities, including organizations and local food vendors such as ha Happy Cup Coffee Company of Portland and Karina's Bakery of Beaverton. And whereas, the City of Portland resolved in resolution number 36925 to affirm the commitment to create a strategic plan that enabled the city to become a model employer of people with disabilities in 2012. The City of Portland subsequently resolved in 2016 to adopt a model employer strategic plan with resolution number 37235. 
Furthermore, in 2022, the City Disability Network helped the BHR Disability Employment Program to develop their three-year strategic plan to implement the Model Employer Strategic Plan and encourages the City to prioritize the implementation of this work in the future. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, Mayor of the City of Portland, the City of Roses, do hereby proclaim October 2023 to be National Disability Employment Awareness Month in Portland and encourage all residents to observe this month. Thank you all. quick recess and we'll come down there and, and uh, somebody who knows how to take a good photo can take a photo. It shouldn't be me. <laughs>
as well as hear some details about the next steps in the process. And we're asking for a vote today on emergency to ensure the Bureau's work can start as soon as possible. So um, I'll turn it over to um, Julie and Jess from uh, Procurement and BPS to introduce themselves and, and talk about the work. Great, thank you. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, I'm Julie Oaken with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. And as Commissioner Rubio mentioned, this is Jess Klein from Procurement Services. Um, we have just a couple of two short agenda items we decided thought to bundle them together today. So um, we have this quick technical amendment, um, a little bit of background about the work that is uh, afforded by that amendment and this um, ordinance, and then um, Jess will provide the procurement report associated with the work. So this was uh, ordinance 191034. Um, when we were getting to uh, execute the agreements for the contractors of the price agreements, um, we were notified by the city attorney's office the language in the original directives did not accurately reflect the ordinance findings. So um, as you saw in today's meeting packet, it's simply uh, an updating of the first directive of the ordinance um, to match the findings. Again, this is not asking for funding. It's really just to make sure that everything is in alignment from the original ordinance. As you know, much of BPS's work focuses on our community engagement, education, and outreach. The ordinance was written to allow procurement to work with BPS to facilitate a competitive solicitation um, in three categories of work, as noted here on the slide. This will help streamline the work BPS does with contractors and provide services um, and allow our staff to work more efficiently. Over the past three years, these types of services have been purchased under contracts uh, with an average annual spend of $1 million. Many of these contracts are either expiring or have limited funds left after this fiscal year. So to streamline the efforts for bidding and for city staff um, to effectively use the contracting dollars, BPS worked with procurement to issue this solicitation. So Council approved uh, the original ordinance uh, in October of last year for RFP 0002059, and it was posted uh, in February of this year. So this was a really competitive solicitation. We received a total of 36 proposals. A review committee selected and awarded nine contracts in these three categories of work. So here are a few examples um, of the work that uh, to be done. Um, and as the custodian of the comprehensive plan, BPS has this ongoing need for services since the plan mandates that the Bureau work closely with community to develop plans and policies. The Bureau regularly conducts public engagement activities and develops strategic communications related to land use planning, climate action, energy smart cities, digital privacy, and waste collection. So to best engage with the community, and to help staff easily con uh, connect services that benefit Portland's, the RFP streamlined the internal processes of working with contractors, community organizations, and all the efforts uh, to learn from our community, build relationships, and partnerships. So I'll turn it over to Jeff to provide the procurement report. Hey, good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Jess Klein, procurement manager with Procurement Services, uh, and I'm here this morning to read the procurement report into the record. Um, on October 19th, 2022, Council approved Ordinance Number 191034 uh, for procurement services to competitively solicit for on-call services for capacity building and training, community engagement, and strategic communications in accordance with uh, Portland City Code 5.33. The Chief Procurement Officer has advertised and received proposals for RFP 0000259. Five, nine, uh, on behalf of the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability with an overall not to exceed total of $3 million over three years. Proposals were opened on February 28, 2023 and 36 bids were received in three service categories. Uh, um, the following firms were awarded not to exceed on-call price agreements, uh, Enviral Issues uh, for $350,000, ISO Inc. for $350,000, Laura Media Services for $350,000, Ontaros and Associates, $350,000. Enviro Issues for $300,000. Latino Built Association for $300,000. Subduction Consulting for $300,000. Enviro Issues for $250,000. And ISO for $250,000. The total participation uh, for these agreements is 92%. So that's the total COVID participation rate. 
Uh, on call, all contractors currently hold uh, City of Portland business tax registrations are in full compliance with all city contracting requirements. Procurement Services recommends that the Council accept this report and authorize the Chief Procurement Officer to execute price agreements with the awarded contractors. Very good. Does that complete your presentation? Colleagues, any questions at this point? Do we have any public testimony on the ordinance? We have one person signed up. Okay. Alan Combs. They're joining us online. Alan, can you unmute? Alan, you're muted. Hi, Alan Combs? Yeah, uh, Alan, just speak up just a bit. Yeah, let me, all right. There you go. And, uh, Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. Um, my name is Alan Combs. My pronouns are he, him. And um, the reason uh, I appreciate the opportunity to comment on this item, you know, the work the work of uh, ending racism and promoting diversity is of highest priority. And I think the strategic communication uh, vendors that you're seeking are intended to help on that dimension, reaching out to under underreported categories of Portlanders, and that's really important work. But I just have to call out from uh, you know my own direct experience that that isn't an excuse for mediocrity, ineffectiveness, or maybe downright cronyism because I I just can't tell what's going on. So I'm just going to give you an example of one of the vendors and what they've done for you. And I think what they did this for you was in the six digit territory. So if you look to Appendix D, sorry, Appendix C2, Charlie 2 of the Police Accountability Report, there was a series of outreach groups that were done. And I don't know what was paid for this service, but in the end, you reached 124 people. And I understand that all participants were treated with respect and dignity ensuring that they felt valued and welcomed. Each participant received $200 as a compensation for participating. So that's $24,000 right there in direct payments. And again, the vendor got something to do this work. But what did you really get? I mean, if you look at it, you got a response rate of 50% of the people were between the age, ages of 30 to 50. You got 50% or more of the respondents had a college degree, including advanced degrees. 40% of the respondents had incomes over $50,000. Looking at this, it looks like you moved the needle on communicating with people with disabilities and maybe reaching out to slightly younger people. Uh, and I take that back. It was, uh, uh, there was one other area where you might have reached out and got a slightly better mix. Oh, I should also note that about 40% of the respondents were white, right? So what I'm getting at is there are other ways to reach in a safe way data for a far, far less. And you, you, know, you can also weight the responses. And I just wanna say $3 million is a lot of money. And I ask you to take serious consideration about what you're about to do. There's better places to spend this money, public safety, housing and houselessness, arts, parks, roads, and you're gonna spend it on this? And with that, I thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Colleagues, any questions? I, I do. Commissioner Gonzalez? Yeah. They, <clears throat> you know, we we had some interesting dialogue in our team after reviewing the last survey. Uh, what's the citywide survey that we just performed? Just got the report on uh, state of the city, uh, the big one we do in the particular area of how we engage in traditionally underrepresented communities. Uh, get the, get their engagement in that process. And um, I think it echoes, you know, sort of my questions in this area. Um, when we talk about engaging with a community, uh, how do we assure that the vendors we're utilizing are truly representative of that community? And I'll give you examples just to, you know, so 
traditional communities, Latino community, black community, uh, the, the various communities within our, our Asian populations. We, um, and, and truly when I talk about Asian, it's an incredibly diverse community of, uh, of Portlanders. Um, it, it's just how, the, the, the question, kind of the concern is just, when we, when we identify a vendor in that area, we identify an aff affinity group in that area that we'll work with. What steps do we take to actually assure that they are reasonably representative of the, of the racial minority they purport to represent? I think in this instance, um, I'm, I don't have perhaps a direct response to that question. Um, I just want to highlight that, that the intent here is to be able to award the contracts uh, or the price agreements. Um, and we just have examples of work that they might be doing. These aren't specific, you know, we aren't, we aren't saying these are the specific work areas that they will be doing aside from those three, you know, overarching categories that will help BBS's work. Um, so I, I don't know of a vet, the vetting, let's say the vetting process, if that's the question. Yeah, and it, 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 it maybe not an easy question to answer, but so I, I fully appreciate it. So the, um, listening to the list, uh, the list of vendors that you uh, identified, are those, it sounded like, were those all for-profit entities or were there some uh, non-profits in that bucket as well? There's at least one, one is a non-profit. Yes, Commissioner, the um, uh, Latino Built Association is a non-profit um, uh, entity. Got it, got it. Um, you know, I, in, in Mr. Combs' questions, I uh, almost wish he had more time to sort of dig into it, just how we assess the performance of vendors in this area retroactively. I guess maybe could you speak to that after the fact, once they've performed, how, do we have a mechanism for, you know, assessing their performance, uh, quantifying it in any way? Outside of beyond their contractual obligations and whether they were delivered upon. Sure, I'm not aware of reports. I, I'm sure there are <laughs> opportunities for reports to be run um, based on that, you know, what they, what they have done, accomplished uh, in the community or working with us. Um, I'm not aware of the data. Okay, all right, thank you. Can I just weigh in here too? I just wanna say, um, Angelina, you don't have to speak specifically to this, but from just um, general and high level, um, and I can speak for BPS, at least what I know. When we do procurement, um, they, they, and they are selected and put on a list, they have to be validated or, or they're deemed as credible through the, through the process of procurement and selection. So there's a lot of supporting documentation and reference checks and such to make sure that they are valid um, entities that are truly, they are credible in the communities that they're seeking to engage. Is that correct? Yes. And as just noted, like 92% of these are COVID vendors, and the one that isn't actually is the nonprofit, so not COVID. Okay, just wanted to make sure. All right, great. Any further questions? Yeah, my, my hands up. Oh, I'm sorry, Dan. Okay. Commissioner Ryan. Uh, yeah. So first of all, um, thank you, Julie. Thank you, Jess. That was a great presentation. And Alan, I really appreciate your testimony. The organizations that I heard, uh, some of them I know leadership and they're reputable organizations. So my question would be, um, especially after listening to the testimony, is what success looks like. And so is the contract going to have expectations and goals built into it? And will there be reporting to those said expectations and goals. So I think a lot of us just want to make sure that when we do contracts that we know what success looks like and we can measure that success. Yeah, for sure. You yeah. can take this one. <laughs> um, uh, Commissioner, thank you for the question. Um, the, the way that these agreements work, these are price agreements. So they're not, they're not uh, set aside uh, like, you know, we're absolutely going to spend this money. These are um, agreements in which we are allowed to um, Sp you know, spend the money as needed, basically. Th these are on-call agreements. Um, when we issue work under these, these are issued under what's called a task order. Um, and the task order will include things like the deliverables and what is expected as part of the, 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 the product that we get from the firm. Um, and so that's usually how we measure success on these agreements is, are the task orders being delivered in the way that we have outlined for the, the contractor to deliver them? So that's usually how success will be done, and that's usually through the contract management component 
of the of contract of managing the agreements once they're executed. I think that was a yes. So is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. It's okay. I'm trying to do some translation. Um, so in the front end, we do we are crystal clear about what success looks like, and we have measurable goals. Yes. And you use the word deliverables. Yes, that that is one of the things that goes into the um, uh, into the price agreements themselves in the language. Yes. Okay. Just want to make sure that transparency is there. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Rubio. Uh, Donnie, I just wanted to see if you had anything you wanted to add. Okay. All right, very good. Uh, seeing no other questions, item number 895 is an emergency ordinance. Please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Rubio. I want to thank Julie and Jess for this update and, and for um, answering the questions that we're, we're asking of you. Um, this work is really important, and I'm happy to see the high COVID numbers for these contracts. So happy to uh, support this fix. Aye. Ryan. Yeah, thanks for the dialogue. I vote aye. Gonzalez. I, I appreciate the dialogue and I just want to highlight the, the sensitivity in this area. Um, we have a venerable value in the city of Portland in, in we, we, which we would call community engagement and uh, in weighing in on important policy discussions. It's we don't do them in isolation. We engage with our community over an extended uh, process. Uh, one of the challenges of that has been that certain communities are underrepresented in that engagement. And um, I applaud the efforts to supplement kind of traditional community engagement um, with other efforts to reach those who may be English as a second language or otherwise don't participate in the process historically. Um, I will say that I have concerns in recent years that some of that process has been politicalized and that at times there are groups that purport to speak on behalf of communities that may not fully reflect the diversity within those communities. Uh, and what gets presented back as the perspective of a community may not reflect the diversity of perspectives within that community. And uh, so that's my sensitivity in this area. Um, and uh, But I fully support what we're voting on today, and I vote aye. Thank you. Wheeler. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. I'll entertain a motion to accept the report for 896. So moved. Commissioner Maps moves. Can I get a second? Second. Commissioner Rubio seconds. Any further discussion on the report? Seeing none, please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The report is accepted. We'll move to the regular agenda, please. Item number 903. Amend contract with the IES Communications LLC to increase the amount by an additional $500,000 for low voltage structured wiring services. As a reminder, this ordinance would facilitate the installation of access control as well as video software upgrades the Bureau of Environmental Service Facilities. Is there any further discussion on this item? What's the big circuit you just did? Call the roll. It's a second reading. Maps. Um, I'm glad to vote aye on this item. Amongst other things, this ordinance will improve security at a building uh, occupied by the Bureau of Environmental Services, where on October 12th of this month, we had a break in. I hope that the uh, changes that this ordinance will bring about will make occurrences like that more rare in the future, which is why I vote aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance passes. 904, also a second reading. Authorized contract with Jacobs Engineering Group Incorporated for professional, technical, and engineering services for the Columbia Boulevard Wastewater Treatment Plant wet weather clarifiers and hypochlorite system modification project for amount up to $15,800,000. Any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted, 905. Accept an appropriate grant in current fiscal year for $78,455 from Oregon Department of Transportation and authorize intergovernmental agreement for the Southeast 26th Avenue Cleveland High School Crossing Improvement Project. This is an emergency ordinance. Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This item comes to us from PBOC. Uh, this ordinance authorizes the City of Portland to accept a $78,455 
dollar grant from the state of Oregon. This ordinance also authorizes PBOT to enter into an intergovernmental agreement with the state of Oregon on how these funds will be spent. PBOT plans to spend these funds to design and build road safety improvements adjacent to Cleveland High School. This project will construct a pedestrian island, curb cuts, a uh, marked sidewalk, and lighting. Now, colleagues, every year PBOT completes hundreds of safety improvements across this city. All of those improvements matter. However, some PBOT road safety projects resonate more deeply than others. That is true for the ordinance before us today. The street safety improvements that will be funded by this project are near the intersection of 26th and Powell, where a little more than a year ago, on October 4th, 2022, Portlander Sarah Pleinner was killed while riding her bike. Accepting this grant from the state of Oregon will enable PBOT to make that intersection safer. Partnerships like the one that we are proposing between ODOT and PBOT are essential to making this intersection uh, safer because this section of Powell is owned by ODOT, which means the only way the city of Portland can make this section of Powell safer is to partner with the state, which is what we are doing with this ordinance before us today. And now here to tell us more about this ordinance, uh, we have staff from PBOT. I'll turn over the presentation. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Commissioner. Wendy Colley, your city traffic engineer. Good morning. Um, I have a couple slides. Great. And if you just go to the second one. I just have two. I wanted to share uh, what the proposed improvement looks like an island with some curb ramps and a marked crosswalk and some signage that leads directly to the front door of Cleveland High School. Now this improvement came out of recommendations from the residents and neighbors around Cleveland High School and along Powell. Um, our, leg our state legislators uh, convened a Powell task force after the death of Sarah Pliner, where we coordinated, we met a approximately monthly with a group of neighbors and ODOT to look at what we could do along Powell and in the vicinity of Cleveland High School to improve safety. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to share um, briefly uh, some of the things that came out of our collaboration in the past year that PBOT um, devoted staff time and funding to, as well as ODOT devoted staff time and funding to some of these things. We were able to reduce the speed on Powell from 35 miles per hour to 30 miles per hour. We implemented a 20 mile per hour school zone with flashing beacons on Powell at Cleveland High School and at Creston Elementary, which is further east on Powell. We installed signs that say turning vehicles stop for bikes and pedestrians at 26th Avenue, and we replaced uh, green bike boxes and stop bars and markings that were removed about five years ago at the request of ODOT. We installed high visibility crosswalk markings at 26th Avenue, 28th, 42nd, and 69th Avenues along Powell Boulevard. We installed pedestrian head starts, which give pedestrians a few seconds lead time before vehicles are allowed to go on green. We did that at 21st, 26th, 33rd, and 42nd, and we have more planned between 42nd and 82nd Avenue. We installed speed feedback signs. Those are the signs that blink and tell drivers what their speeds are at 27th and 31st in anticipation of the installation of fixed speed cameras later this year. Uh, we installed pedestrian crossing, or we will be installing the pedestrian crossing improvement on 26th Avenue um, at the front door of Cleveland High School. That's what we are accepting this grant for. We are developing traffic safety curriculum at Cleveland High School, Kellogg Middle School, and Creston Elementary School as part of our Safe Routes to School program. Uh, we are working with Creston School for local street improvements, not necessarily on Powell, but other surrounding streets. And then I mentioned the speed safety camera uh, that is being planned um, at Cleveland High School or near Cleveland High School. And after a triple fatality at 63rd Avenue on Powell, we will be installing a second set of speed cameras near 63rd Avenue in 2024. And uh, that's all I have for my presentation. I am happy to answer any questions you might have. Very good. Colleagues, any questions? 
Commissioner Ryan? A timeline on this improvement when you see it through fruition? Oh, uh, spring of 2024, we anticipate being able to start construction. Start this spring? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Well, that's soon. Uh, any testimony? No one signed up. This is an emergency ordinance. Please call the roll. Maps. Um, I want to thank staff for uh, today's presentation. I also want to thank community members for working with PBOT to help uh, figure out how we can make uh, this section of Powell safer. Um, I also want to express my authentic appreciation um, and gratitude to our partners at the State of Oregon for working with us to make sure that um, this section of Powell Boulevard is safe. Uh, for these reasons and more, I vote aye. Rubio. Um, I want to thank Commissioner Maps and the PBOT team for their leadership and for securing this grant from ODOT. It's really great to see these investments, um, and it's really nice to have that full picture that you gave us. So thank you for that. I vote aye. Ryan. Yeah, I'm delighted to see this on the agenda, and I'm happy to hear that the action actually will be uh, quicker than most. And I was at a football game at Cleveland High School, and the principal, Joanne Watkins, made it really clear this is a high priority. Mm -hmm and spent much of the time wanting me to really understand that. And then we, of course, heard from the mother um, a couple weeks ago here at City Council. So I, um, I hope she's watching and this brings a little bit of peace of mind to her on this day. And I vote aye. Gonzalez. Yeah, it's such an inter important intersection for Southeast. I, I cross Powell regularly when cycling. Um, my children have played at Cleveland High School fields quite a bit. Um, there are the, the pedestrian deaths that we've witnessed on Powell over the years um, uh, certainly have been particularly impactful in our homeless communities. Um, but uh, for the children that attend Cleveland, for their families, I think this is an important step. So I vote aye. Thank you for your work. Wheeler. Uh, good job, Commissioner Maps. Good job, P. Bot. Uh, good job, people in the community who pushed for this at a time when we're uh, working to try and find ways to, to accomplish what we need to accomplish around transportation due to uh, financial considerations. Obviously, grants are a huge opportunity for us. I really appreciate that you took, took, the, uh, took the bridle here and uh, we're su successful. This will make a big difference in that neighborhood and I really appreciate we're able to do it. I vote aye. Thanks. And the ordinance is adopted. We have one item on the consent agenda that was pulled 901. Yeah. Amend um, towing and disposition of vehicles code to expand tow authority and define lawful possession of an impounded vehicle. Commissioner Maps. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to pull this one back to my office. Without objection, and we're adjourned.